Expo Film Festival. In the frame is a series of discussions with a host of very special guests, and we'll be looking to delve deep into the festival programme, give a little more insight on the films that we love. With a different topic each week, we will hopefully point out films that maybe escaped your attention, or maybe just didn't stand out to you when you first sort of read through. Um, today, uh, on In the Frame, we're talking about uh, breaking the celluloid ceiling, and that is focusing on underrepresented filmmakers that have brought films to us for the film festival. Um, as I said, my name is Chris, I'm the programme coordinator. I'm sitting in my office, I'm surrounded by my toys in the background there, you can see, because I'm a big man-child. Um, and I am delighted to welcome two very special guests to chat with me today about some lovely, lovely films. So I'm going to pass over to them and I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves and say hello to everyone. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Ayanna Murray. Um, I'm a culture writer and film critic. I've written for publications like GQ and ID and um, I'm a long time uh, Glasgow Film Festival attendee. So yeah. Thanks for having me. <laughs> That's what we like. Um, and I'm Ailey Akaladi. I'm a kind of babyish culture writer. I've written for places like Galdem and The Skinny and Bella Caledonia. Um, and I'm a student as well. Um, so yeah, I'm just a big lover of Glasgow film in general. Well, that's good. You passed the first test that you both have said <laughs> that you like Glasgow Film Festival. Because if that had not been the case, then the, the feed would have just cut out there. Um, <laughs> so obviously you both said that you enjoy for Glasgow Film Festival, you've been before and stuff. Um, I guess maybe it would be nice just to start off and just ask you a little bit about your experiences with the Glasgow Film Festival in the past and, and um, if there's any sort of fond memories you have of the festival, um, just anything that springs to mind. I actually have a really good story. Um, <laughs> um, do you remember the year where there was like um, a blizzard, basically? Based from the east, um, yep. Yeah. <laughs> that was my um, first year. <laughs> yeah, I was. I was. Um, I was still at uni at the time in Sterling, so um, I would like take the train every day to go see films, and then I was going to see the Rider, um, Chloe Zhao's last film, and. Um, we were about to go in and then they were like, um, actually like the film's canceled because of the beast from the east, so you should probably go home. And then and then I was like, I was just being naive and I was like, oh, it's gonna be fine, like the snow will go away eventually. I'll go away and see some other films. And then um yeah, the snow was so bad that I ended up like being stuck in Glasgow for three days. <laughs> um, uh, that was nice to be stuck in. Yeah, ex exactly. It was just it was just a very like um like frantic um, chase to find like hotels that I could book like on short notice and stuff. Um, but like it was it was very weird at the time. But now I look back on it, and it was like very funny. Uh, but that's one of my yeah. best uh, Glasgow memories, I'd say. And Ailey, was there anything that stuck out to you in the past? I mine is just like a collection of like childhood like moments of like my mom like taking me along to the gft and me being all like oh why can't we go to sunny world and see all the films that all my <laughs> friends are seeing like all these like superhero films not that there's anything wrong with superhero films now but i remember thinking as like a little like eight-year-old or whatever like oh this isn't that cool and stuff like that and then all of a sudden i was like oh that yeah and like my mom is that too, like, <laughs> yeah Awesome. Yeah, so um, Beast from the East, that's, a, you know, that's one of the stories that the Glasgow Film Festival staff laugh about now, and there's many a story that is probably not suitable for the, uh, the live broadcast, but, you know, um, yeah, that was quite a time, and likewise, GFT has been in my heart for a long time in terms of, like, growing up and going to see things there, and uh, it's just been a, a wonderful place. So it's so nice to have you both here to chat and, and we'll, we'll sort of jump into it. Um, so as I said, today's episode is Breaking the Celluloid Ceiling. We're focusing on underrepresented filmmakers that are showing films at our film festival. And the sort of idea of today is uh, we've, we've tasked Anna and Ailey, Ailey to um, come up with three films from the programme that they've either seen or are really looking forward to, and we're going to have a little bit of a deep dive into it. And 
just have a talk about why they necessarily love the film or why they think you should see the film. And yeah, so um, I think to start off, we'll start off with one of the Anna's picks and it's the opening film of the film festival. And it's a wonderful, wonderful film that is one of my picks of the year. I'm sure it'll be on every top 10 list or most people's top 10 lists, top five lists at the end of the year. And that is Lee Isaac Chung's wonderfully poignant and sweet Minari. So, Iana, if you want maybe to kick us off and tell us why you chose this film and why you think the Glasgow Film Audience should take the time and watch it. Yeah, um, I feel like, I don't know, I've just been so looking forward to see this film all year since it was at Sundance a year ago and I was just highly anticipating for, anticipating it for the entire year. So much so that like um, when it was like going around virtual film festivals in the US, I went and like bought a ticket to one of them and that's how I saw Minari for the first time because I was just so desperate to see it. Um, but that was a good that was a good plan anyway because I ended up loving it so much um, and I was really excited to see that it's opening film for Glasgow Film Festival. Um, yeah, the film the film just really spoke to me in a way that that I found that I find is rare. Um, it's about um, this Korean family that moves from California to Arkansas, and um, the the father Jacob, who's played by the amazing Stephen Yun, um, he's intent on um, starting a farm um but the but he finds some like difficulties along the way and his wife isn't really um she doesn't really approve of what he's trying to do she thinks like their life before was was fine um it's it's an immigrant story but it's also just about i'd say like the pursuit of the american dream um and like what a futile like journey that can be for so many people and I think like like race is a component to it, but I don't think it's the defining feature of the film, which I think is what really resonated with me. Um, you know, like I find that so many stories in film where I can see myself in, it tends to be like it's just about what race they what what race they are. Um, but I don't think that's the case here, but it is still a component to it. For an ex as an example, I'd say it's like, um, so the film is like through the perspective of um, the son, David, who's played by this amazing child actor, Alan Kim. He's so cute and so amazing. Yep. Um, um, there's a scene, I don't want to go into too many specifics, but there's a scene where um, the kids meet these um, these white kids basically at the church. And um, they the kids ask these like, seemingly innocent questions to them about you know being Korean but it's actually like quite offensive and um I think like those types of microaggressions I've had like very similar experiences to that growing up and you kind of just learn to like absorb that and move on but like even still now like I think back I have like very few memories of like early primary school but like the, t the kinds of microaggressions that I've had are definitely like memories that stick out to me. And to see that in film, I I don't think I've rarely seen it. I think like racism usually, again, racism isn't the major thing about Minari, but you know, it's just a part of life that that comes with like, being, an, being an immigrant basically. Um, but I think, you know, it's so honest and it's so, poignant and I think you know even if you aren't an immigrant or you're not someone if you're not a person of color I think um there's so many elements of it that can that can resonate with you and um I mean oh, I could go on for so long Stephen Yun's amazing I I'm so mad about the Golden Globes that, that you got snubbed I'm gonna be so mad about that forever um but uh yeah I, I'm just, I just love the film so much I could talk about it forever <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's breaking. I think breaking news got announced today that Minari was um, nominated for the Golden Globe, but just in the foreign film category. I think that's the only one it received, which 
does seem odd to me. I would have thought that they would have got a bit more than that. But you know, there's been a, there was a few glaring omissions from the Golden Globes. But you know, that's not always the um, you know the the you know standard for uh, awards always. So you know, it's just one of those things. But it just means that you know you everyone should definitely buy a ticket for to watch it at Glasgow Film Festival. I liked what you were talking about there in regards to um, the sort of microaggressions because when I watched it, the big striking thing for me was that uh, as someone who is the son of a Malaysian immigrant that moved to Glasgow in the 70s, you know, and growing up as a mixed race person who doesn't necessarily look, you know, uh, Malaysian or anything like that, um, but has a, a name like Kumar, you know, it's, it's there is, that, like you say, that scene in the film which this isn't a spoiler, it's just there's a scene where they, they go to the church and the white kids are kind of like, why don't you sound foreign and things like that? It's that sort of weird sort of thing. And and um, I totally, when you're a kid, I don't think you really think about that sort of stuff. You you notice it, but those sort of microaggressions don't really resonate as much at the, at the time. And it's not until yeah. you revisit that later that you think about it. Um, so... The film brought up a lot of stuff like that for me, but not in a bad way, just in a, in a way that just made you feel, you know, connected to the film. And the big takeaway for me from the film is, and I, this is a thing from a lot of films that I love, it's just a film about people trying to do their best. It's about people trying to do the best they can for the people they love and just trying to find a place to call their own. And that is very much evident throughout the whole film. And I think universally that's a, a a message that everyone can get behind you know i don't i don't think it really doesn't matter about about your race for that sort of thing it's it's very much a, a universal message and i just think uh, just to concur i think uh, the cast are great Stephen yin has came from you know the walking dead which obviously i'm a big fan of and i love Stephen yin from that but he's came from the walking dead and he's done films like burning which was one of my top films of the of previous years as well. And now he's obviously done Minari and he's just a, a wonderful, wonderful actor. But the whole cast just puts in, you know, you know, home run performances. Um, so, yeah, it looks beautiful. And I think Lee Isaac Chung has just really managed to paint a wonderful picture of people trying to find their way in life. So, um, yeah, I just have to agree with everything you say. And, and, that's my probable personal pick from the festival is please take the time and watch Minari, which I believe the tickets are selling incredibly fast and, and it may be a sellout soon. So if you haven't bought a ticket for that, I would suggest you do it quickly. And uh, Ailey, I know I don't, I don't believe you've seen Minari yet, but do you have any thoughts in terms of your uh, expectations for it or your, your, your you know, you know um, hopes for it? I was looking, I was like watching the trailer and I think something I didn't really expect going into it was like, it looks very it looks very joyful and it's comedy looks quite it just seems so wholesome and so honest and i know there's a bit at the end of the trailer and one of the wee boys is talking to his grand being like you're not like normal grands you swear you wear men's underwear and i just think there's something like it is it just seems really honest and i think there's so much joy to be had in that honesty and that kind of like unashamed depiction of what family life is like so yeah i am um, after this i will go straight and buy a ticket because i didn't realize they were selling out that quickly but no yeah i'm very excited to see it yeah absolutely uh yeah it's just it seemed like a no-brainer for us in terms of it's such a wonderful film and so many people have been clamoring to see it and you know as soon as you watch it you just get swept up in it so um yeah absolutely uh, minari an absolutely brilliant pick uh so yeah <laughs> that's a good good one to start on but I think now what we'll move on to is one of Ailey's picks. And I believe you got the chance to see Gagarin. And yeah. that was on that list. So, again, just if you want to talk me through about what you liked about the film and what you you hope that the the Glasgow film audience will, will get from the film as well. Um, I have to say, I'm, I'm obsessed with this. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like this film before. Um, so, basically... Gagarin, uh, it's a housing estate in Paris, or it's not anymore, it's been um, demolished now, I believe. Um, but it basically takes this housing estate as its focus and follows um, a young boy, Yuri, who is named after the communist leader who the housing estate was named after in the first place, if that makes sense. Um, 
and it's um he hears that it's about to be demolished taken down and he tries to like um fix it up and make it all right and of course like his efforts are kind of um go slightly down the drain but it is just this like completely like amazing look into community but also isolation and it seems to it's very interesting that I heard a lot of people talking about how it was like a coming of age story um and I thought it was kind of bizarre in that it doesn't almost feel that way it's almost like a it almost feels like it's about the housing estate rather than Yuri like we don't know that much about Yuri um but we we do know about him through his like his love for space and his love for rockets and you get that throughout the film um and yeah it's this really exciting kind of um pull towards the external and towards like something else while also being drawn into what is safe um like home and I think that tension is really interesting but especially now we're we're all in our homes because we can't go anywhere else but also we all want to leave our homes um and yeah I just I'm completely obsessed with it I think I am gonna have to rewatch it quite a few times yeah I think it so it was, Gagarin was it was selected for Cannes 2020 obviously the, you know Cannes had the the whole issues with the uh, coronavirus so but this film is is fairly fantastical at points and and it but the directors do such a good job of like keeping it, the film grounded um, by having it tied to that sense of community and the building is very much a focal point. And when I was watching it, I found, and I'm not saying that these films are uh, similar in terms of like storyline as such, but when I was watching it, it just kind of made me think about The Last Black Man in San Francisco, which is a film I absolutely adored. And big sort of part of that film is it's all about you know he's the, the main character's you know so obsessed with his with home and the idea of home and he talks about one of the main quotes from it is you don't get to hate it unless you love it and I think in in Gagarin it's very much um I can't remember the line that he says now but basically talks about how he's like if there's nothing wrong with the the place they won't do anything to it and and it's very much protective He's being very protective of it, and it ties into that sense of, you know, that sort of heartfelt thought of home is where you make it. And just because it's maybe not the most glamorous of places, that doesn't make it any less of a home. And and I think some of the shots and the cinematography in the film, the way that they do things to give you that sort of space vibe and and things like that is so like majestic to watch. Um, but as I say, the directors do a really good job of they keeping it reined in and keeping it grounded in the sense that you really do kind of get that sense of community coming through. Because um, as like you say, you don't know too much about Yuri as a character. They don't necessarily delve deep into him as such. It's it's part of the big picture. And yeah, I just thought it, it was a very, very moving and, and wonderfully, you know, beautiful film. So. I totally agree with you and everything you said there. And, and um, yeah, I think it's one that had it sort of screened at can and been a bit and got all that those chances to screen a bit more. I think it would be, a, the, be the buzz would be a lot bigger for it now, I think. But mm -hmm. I think as soon as people see it at the festival, the word will get out there. And I think, again, that's one of those ones I just feel like that's going to resonate with a lot of people. Um, yeah, there was a, 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 I don't believe you've seen Gagarin, but um, have you? seen anything about it and if, is it has it been on your radar no but i'm definitely gonna check it out now it sounds right on my street um i i was actually meant to go to Cannes last year before it was cancelled so i feel like if if can had happened that that would have been on my radar um so uh yeah i'm just really excited to to check it out yep it's it so we're screening the uk premiere of it at glasgow film festival and i believe it's the the 4th of March when it goes live on our platform. So um, I would suggest everyone earmarks that one as one to watch. Um, so moving on to something now, that uh, a film that's slightly different in uh, theme and topics. It's one of Anna's picks and it's Jumbo, which is the UK premiere as well. Um, and it's screening on the 27th of February at Glasgow Film Festival. And uh, I believe it will be getting a wider release in the summer via anti worlds a uh, uk distribution company um and director zoe wittick is has 
sculpted a movie that is is very very interesting and what it deals with and i'll, I'll let you talk a bit more about it and then we'll, we'll we'll discuss it a bit more um yeah i was just very morbidly curious about like how this film could turn out um i'd heard about it when it was at sundance last year um but it's basically um about this woman and um she does night shifts as a mechanic or a janitor or something uh, at a at a rundown theme park in Belgium and she ends up falling in love with um, uh, this theme park ride of like a tilt-a-whirl thing. Um, um, actually like a few years ago I'd seen like a video about um, this woman who'd like fallen in love with a roller coaster and it was just like I it was pretty like exploitative, like, oh, look how weird this woman is. She's in love with this object. So I was curious about how the film would approach this story, considering that it's like based on a true story and it says that it is. Um, um, but in reality, it's actually really weirdly wholesome and sincere. And um, I really, I really love that about the film. It doesn't, you know, look down on her. It really takes her feelings seriously. It's it's actually like, like a film more about acceptance than anything. She has a mother. Um, um, she's still uh, the woman. She still lives with her mother, and um, and her mom doesn't really understand her attraction to this theme park ride, and really wants her to like change her ways, but like. Um, I think it's like a film that's about, you know, mothers and daughters and, you know, mothers like not accepting who their children have turned into and kind of, you know, learning to accept them for who they are. Um, I was, yeah, I was just really surprised by um, just how sincere this film was. And I was also really curious about how they would approach just like the attraction between um, what are it's reciprocal, I don't know, but like between <laughs> the woman and um, I forgot her name, but like her and, and the theme park ride. Um, but it's actually really interesting, like in taking her point of view, um, seeing how she sees that the theme park reciprocates her feelings. It's really fascinating. There's some sequences in it that are so surreal. Um, I don't want to go too deep into it because it's honestly like, it's better like going in blind, um, but it's so surreal and strange and just really um, fascinating to watch. Um, I think like another um, major point in this is that it stars uh, Naomi Merlant, who was in um, Portrait of a Lady on Fire and um, she's so amazing she kind of um there's a lot of similarities in kind of like the romance between it in, in both of the films and just like how intensive and like all consuming it can be and um she does a really good job of just acting opposite the theme park ride um um i thought she was amazing and um yeah this is just a big surprise for me it was something that i just um seeked out uh, out of just like morbid curiosity and ended up like feeling really compelled by it um yeah I yeah i think it. when you <laughs> i think when you read the synopsis and what it's about it was the same for me I, i'd heard about it because it screened at a lot of festivals around the, the world and when i read what it was about i was like oh okay that sounds very interesting and um it's it's a very interesting film. I think I like that you touched on the mother-daughter relationship because that is a big part of the film. And I think um, the nice thing about it is that they clearly have a relationship there that's not what you necessarily expect in terms of you You would maybe think that the mother would be very like, what are you doing, you mentalist? Why are you like, you know, uh, in a uh, theme park rides? It's <laughs> that sort of weird thing. But you can tell that they have a sort of strange but functioning relationship, but there's love there. So it's quite sweet and nice in that sense. And certainly from the point of view of um, the sort of attraction between Jumbo and, and the main character, it's 
it's so beautifully done and the way that some of the shots are like you do get swept up in it and you kind of start going oh i understand why she's attracted to this theme park there i can get that um, he's a gentleman <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely you know i mean we could all take advice from jumbo i think <laughs> men okay um but you know it's, it's, it's like a sort of weird mix of a coming of age love story sort of thing going on but um yeah naomi Milan is brilliant in it um and yeah it's just one of those films that you it's it was funny when i was watching it, i was just thinking and this isn't related to the film and this is maybe me just going off on a tangent but i was like i can just imagine uh, the process of filming a film like that and and the director yells cut and, and naomi's just like ah oh, this this they're giving me nothing here and it's like well, what would you expect from an animal object of course they're giving you nothing like it's all in you to do that so i just imagine actually having to act in a film like that it must have been such a challenge for an actor like that to do that sort of thing so that alone is probably something to behold you know so um yeah it's just like i say a very very interesting film that um i certainly haven't seen something like it in, a, in you know maybe ever possibly and and um yeah very interesting the way it tackles the subject of um you know object sexuality objectophilia whatever you want to call it um because i believe zoe Whittock, the director did actually do a lot of research into it and there was a story about a uh, woman an american woman who married the eiffel tower like years ago and that's kind of where the sort of basis for the film came from so yeah very interesting Ailey was there have you paid any attention to Jumbo did you have you read about it or is this the first of hearing of it and now instantly want to see it <laughs> I read it but no I've just I had um I had had a look at it before and I think it is what draws me to it is like um what you were both saying that it's not about shock factor and it's not about this is so weird, like, can't believe she's into this theme park ride. Um, it, it does seem to explore it with, like, a kind of gentleness and a kind of warmth, it looks like anyway. Um, and it does look beautiful, which is not something I think I would ever say about a theme park, but it really does <laughs> look beautiful, so, yeah. Yeah, it's a little misleading. I don't know if uh, theme parks, especially, you know, uh, if you go to the Iron Brew Carnival in Glasgow, I mean, it's not that beautiful, trust me, it's really not. So, you know... <laughs> But yeah, I'm sure if you went to the carnival, you would see some sights. So, um, you know, whatevs, you know, each to their own, no judging here. But um, Jumbo, <laughs> like I say, UK premieres, it's on the, the Glasgow Film at Home uh, platform on the 27th of February. So um, I definitely urge you to seek that one out, especially if you're a big fan of Naomi Milan. She's, she's just amazing. And, and Zoe Whittock as well is just a wonderful director. Um, so moving on um, to one of Ailey's picks now, um, and we're moving on to Spring Tide, which is a Chinese film that is screening, a, which is having its UK premiere, and that is screening from the 25th of February on Glasgow Film Festival at home. And yeah, it's a really interesting um, film about the sort of dynamic of a mother-daughter dynamic through the generations and, and um, I'll let Ailey talk a bit more about why she liked it or if she didn't like it <laughs> maybe she didn't like it I haven't asked that yet so go ahead yeah <laughs> yeah no I loved it it was something a bit different because I think um like different to a lot of other films in that it's not really driven by plot it is it feels like a character study um and so what we have we have um three generations of women um all kind of living in the same flat um so a grandmother, a mother and a daughter. Um, and it's really interesting to see how they kind of grapple with the past and they have to deal with the past and all its implications in the present day. And how as well, um, their generation and their political, how they grew up in their political times um, kind of shaped them and shaped their relationships to motherhood and to daughterhood. Um, so like their relationship to China and to the politics um, shapes the relationship. And I think it's quite interesting to see that, how, um, you know, political life does actually cause, have quite a huge impact on our relationships. Um, and it is, it is like at times quite difficult to watch and quite heartbreaking, um, but in a way that's not too painful, I think. I, I When I first watched the trailer, I was like, oh God, like this is gonna be a lot. I don't know if I can do this, but like it really does like, keep you at an okay level and it it is it is there's a lot of joy in it there's a lot of hope in it and especially like 
the ending. I know I read a few things that had said the ending was disappointing, but I thought it was actually quite like hopeful and stuff. So um, not to give anything away or anything, but yeah, no, it's really quite lovely and it's different to anything I've really seen before. Um, and again, like looking at space, it's quite interesting to see how each space and each home kind of defines their relationships um, as well and like how they it shapes the three women um yeah and exploring daughterhood as well as motherhood as well i was thinking about quite a lot um because i think we think a lot about um and rightly so we think a lot about what it means to be a mother and things like that but like also in the sense of what it means to be a daughter um and the weight of that on all these three women um is really interesting to see so yeah i would highly recommend yeah i think um it absolutely feels like you say it feels, feels a bit more like a character study as opposed to uh mm -hmm. uh so when I was looking at when I was watching it and that, the sort of notes I wrote down was it doesn't necessarily feel like you're getting the start of this is the start of the story and this is the end of the story. It's like they're lifting a chunk out and they're taking that chunk and giving you it and saying this is kind of what happens at this time in the life. But, you know, that's just giving you a little snapshot, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you can kind of, you know, again, not to give away anything from the film, but, you know, as you go through the film, you see the way that these characters interact. And I found that the sort of, you know, the sort of main character, that she's very, like, holds back her feelings for a lot of the film. And there's that kind of simmering tension there, but it's not like a simmering tension that is like, um, that you'd expect from maybe something that's very harsh, if you know what I mean. It's mm -hmm. just that kind of familiar, that sort of family sort of tension that can arise sometimes when you have like an issue with a, a family a family member, especially if it's something that's you know sort of grown over the years, which I think this film mm -hmm. kind of does a good job of bringing to the front forefront. But I think absolutely it examines sort of that mother daughter daughter mother relationship over different generations and I can see a lot of people watching it and and kind of you know sitting there and they'll be doing that they'll be like mm. and then looking <laughs> at their mum or they'll be like mm, and looking at their, their daughter like yeah you know like that sort of thing that sort of very knowing looks because I think you people will identify a lot with it um yeah and it was uh, was this a film that was on your radar at all did you know anything about it before Ailey kind of so wonderfully you know described it um no, I, I didn't know anything about it. Um, so I, I feel like I have to see it now. Um, I don't know, it reminded me a little bit of like, I don't know if they're like remotely similar at all, but like about Lady Bird and kind of the relationships between mother and daughter and kind of like simmering tensions. I don't know, the way that like you described it, it made me think of like my mom and my sister have quite like, <laughs> Have a relationship and uh, when they saw Lady Bird together they were like oh yeah this is us and it made me think like oh maybe if they watched that film they would feel like the same thing um but I'm definitely a big fan of like films about women that's definitely my thing um films about motherhood and daughterhood I love that and um yeah it definitely sounds like something right up my street so I'll have to check it out there you go. See, we're, we're providing you with a, way, a breadth of like choices here that you're going to get to the point where you're just going to have to spend all your money and just buy just yeah. watch every film if you can, like every day. You just have to block off two weeks of your life and just use all your holidays for that. Um, not that we actually have anything to do, you know, so, uh, you know, that's the perfect reason to stay at home and watch the films. Um, so we've talked about, about two, the sort of two films that you've both seen and you've enjoyed. Um, just from my point of view, just to interject a little bit, I've cheated a little bit because I've not really done uh, traditional three picks of films. But the one thing that I would do, the sort of one thing that's came up for me um, that I'd like to flag is that we announced it this week. It's the Welcome to um, program, which is an amazing program that um, uh, uh, two festival two festival programmers we brought on Natasha and Tamiwa have worked on tirelessly over the last few months. To bring to us and it's uh, split into two sort of sections so we've got welcome to a focus on black women filmmakers which will premiere on the platform on the 5th of march and we've got one that's welcome to lineages of the landscape which uh, will premiere on the 7th of march on the, the, the platform and within these each little sections what they've done is they're, they're trying to um look for black filmmakers specifically kind of with scottish ties um and just try and highlight these sort of people because 
one thing I know from speaking to them, they did. They said it was it was a it's a tough task because it's it's hard to find the material. So um, the the aim is hopefully they can bring these 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 sort of films to light a bit more and and spread the word a bit and hopefully that that you know people will just be a bit more aware of the, the need for that sort of you know uh, those opportunities. So a focus on black film women filmmakers is really great because it's welcome to the Terror Dome, which was. Uh, I believe it's one of the, the first black British women to have a film released in the UK cinemas back in 95, 96. Um, so that's something I don't think a lot of people will probably have seen. Um, certainly um, or that, or they've, they've, they've maybe not given as much notice as they, they should have done. They will also have a, a short film screening with that by Adura Onashili, which screened at LFF about a toilet attendant working at a Glasgow nightclub. It's called Expensive Shit, and it's a, a really amazing short film and just really ties into Glasgow so well because I think we've all been in, you know, a nightclub and, you know, but, and I, I know myself, you go in the nightclubs and there's just that, that horrible thing where you see drunk people accosting the poor toilet attendants, you know, who are just doing their job and stuff. And But this, this short film has a bit more of a, a sort of, twist to it and i won't say any more but i do recommend that people do to seek, seek it out and then um a family called a brew which is also part of that program which is a sort of like archival doc around black culture and communities that formed in 19th, 19th century scotland and and just kind of shows you kind of how things were in the past and and um yeah that's a that's a really good sort of it's quite a short doc but um very very like you know you watch it and you feel like oh, okay this this feels really pertinent to today still and, and it's amazing and yeah so that program is in itself is wonderful but they've only gone and done it again and done as a brilliant second thing which is lineages of the landscape and that has a, a, a doc that i'd never heard of and until they brought it to my attention and it's called angelo on bonds and it's screened in like 95, 96 as well. And Maya Angelou, the you know, the iconic poet, she's obviously a big fan of Robbie Burns. And she came to Scotland and she sort of, you know, delved into his his lineage and where they came from. And and it just sounds like it sounds like that just sort of lovely, wholesome sort of content that you want to see and and someone being so passionate about something that's inspired them. Um so yeah, really looking forward to that. And they also have the X in Scotland, which is talking about the impact of Malcolm X and what he had, the impact he had on Africans and Asian people in Scotland. Um, which I think just you know just goes to show that the impact that man had, you know, on, on so many lives. And uh, again, something that I wasn't very aware of before they brought it to my attention. And then finally, in that lineages of landscape program, they've got three fellows, which is about lumberjacks that essentially are like come to Scotland to fell trees and they're essentially fighting fascism through that and it sort of morphs into how they find the way in Scotland and how that becomes the home and it's just like you know a really wonderful sort of program that really delves deep into you know and you know sort of black lives and, and black lives in Scotland so um, that for me is one that I definitely recommend everyone to sort of seek out um uh like i say it's screening on the 5th and the 7th of march at the end of the festival um so i don't think you can really argue as well for what you're getting for the in each package it's such a wonderful like thing to do so yeah i don't know if either of you guys had seen the the, the press release that we released about it this week but um there's a lot more detail on there so if you seek out on twitter obviously for anyone watching you can find out more about that and there's some quotes from natasha and tamiwa who just are oh, just amazing so um yeah i don't know uh, if you guys had heard about it but um i would definitely recommend it to you too as well um i think it's it's definitely worth some of your time um so yeah um that's my cheaters one because like i say it's it's basically i've done all my choices in that one um but i'm wary of like taking up too much time with my stupid partner mm -hmm. and face because you know we've got amazing lovely guests who are probably more interesting than me so uh, we'll move on to two films now that um both of you are very keen to see and haven't had the chance to see yet so the first one uh, is the which is a uh, part of a korean uh, country focus 
and it's having its UK premiere on the 27th of February at Glasgow Film Festival. And Diana, this is one of your picks. Um, so obviously you haven't seen the film, but what is it about the film that stood out to you when you looked into it and why are you so excited to see it? Um, well, when, when you announced that the country focus was South Korea, I was really excited because um, I just love South Korean film. Um, so uh, just immediately based on that, I was just excited to see like anything in the country focus. And when I was like looking for the films, honestly, I, I'm probably going to see all of them because I'm, I'm just really excited for um, that slice of the program. Um, and um, when I was like picking my films for this, um, I was just going along the lines of like, what's like, what could be like a really great discovery in the program that people might not look over? Something that like even I would probably look over. Um, um, and yeah, just looking for the country focus, um, the capo really stood out to me. Um, it's basically, um, I mean, reading from what it's about, it's about this musician who um, reconnects with his bandmate, who's now a teacher at a music school. And um, he helps his pupils sort of like start a band and um, enter a music contest. And um, that just sounded really appealing and fun to me. Um, it sounds like School of Rock, which I love, um, but it also reminded me a little bit of like Sing Street of just like friends getting together and making music and it's just like wholesome and fun. Um, so that just sounded um, really appealing to me. I think like one of the great things about um, festivals like and especially Glasgow Film Festival is that like you can make these um, great discoveries of films that you might not have heard of. They don't really have like any recognizable names attached. Um, but like the benefit of the festival is that like you can find these things that that you wouldn't usually seek out. Um, and I think, um, you know, just judging by the synopsis, I honestly don't know very much about it. I really couldn't find anything about the film. Um, um, but just like judging by the synopsis and like the the comparisons that I'm making to, to films that, are, that seem a bit similar, um, it sounded really fun and wholesome and um, and just like a great crowd pleaser, which uh, you can't argue against. Um, so yeah, that was yeah. one of my picks for me. Well, I'm glad you chose that one because this one, DiCapo is one of my ones that I really was pushing for for the festival. As soon as I saw it, I was like, yeah, this is lovely. Like, you know, I'm just <laughs> sitting there watching it, just like, you know, sitting like that, just, you know, like this. Hmm. <laughs> you know, like, just uh, very nice, like School of Thought vibes, definitely. Uh, Sing Street vibes, definitely. The bands, the, the young kids in the band are so funny and like cool. And the tunes that they, they have, like creative differences and stuff. And like, because they, 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 they don't know which direction they want to go in and stuff. And it's just very good. And, you know, no spoilers, obviously, but at some at point in the film, there's an amazing guitar battle between the teacher and one of the students it's like really cool and you're just watching it like ah oh, man these people are so cool like, i've been playing guitar for like 20 years and i'm not even remotely as good as this like these kids are so good and and yeah um just plenty of heart the music's good as well like um you know there's just something about that specific sort of you know asian pop rock that comes to you know music that just strikes a chord to me i really really just like I'm just like watch it going, yeah, you know, like ooh, you know, like that sort of thing. So very light and enjoyable and a nice like like you say, I think it's one of those ones that I wish people could see it in the cinema because I think it's a, that sort of crowd pleaser that people will be like nodding along, tapping their feet as the film plays. So I guess everyone will just have to do it at home. I guess that means that everyone that watches at home can get up and dance. So that's probably a good thing without you know getting someone's way. So yeah, DiCaprio. <laughs> Really, really nice film, um, and it's it's it. We're so happy to have it as part of the the Korean country focus. I think um, everyone obviously loved, you know, loves films like Parasite and things like that. And that's kind of the the Parasite coming out last year was very much opened a lot of people's eyes to Korean cinema, and and maybe they think now that oh, that's what Korean films are like, but that's not the case. And, the Cap was a perfect example of, you know, something that is a nice, lovely film that doesn't necessarily have, 
you know, you know. Well, I'm not going to give any spoilers to Parasite just in case anybody's not seen it yet, which I'm <laughs> not the case. But yeah, so DiCaprio, definitely a wonderful film. And Ailey, moving on to your pick, which and again is another one that I have a lot of fondness for. Um, polystyrene, I am a cliche. So what was it about this one that really stood out to you and made you uh, really anticipate it? Um, yeah, so it's about if for some reason I hadn't heard of Paula Styrene before and now going back and watching all this footage of her um, performing, I'm like, I know all these lyrics. I just um, I had no idea. Um, so yeah, Paula Styrene, um, a punk artist, a female punk artist from like the 70s. Um, and she passed away about 10 years ago and her daughter, Celeste Bell, has put together this documentary um, looking at her life and her art. Um, and I just think it looks so incredible. I'm so excited to see this really, really interesting figure through the lens of her daughter, um, like not making a symbol out of her, not making like an idol out of her, just like seeing her as a writer and an artist and a mother. Um, I think it is gonna be genuinely just so amazing. I'm so gassed for it. Um, and yeah, and like there's a lot about um, Polly Sarian's music, like, um, all the links to environmentalism and consumerism like I think it's very interesting to be talking about that right now um, because it's what we're talking about right now um, and of course it's it, you know she was so like ahead of her time and even like looking at her um, I was looking at um, there's a video of Celeste Bell like um, talking through her, some of um, her mum's like artwork and it's all that um, very zine like DIY style um, I, that again has, has, is having like this kind of renaissance right now. So I think I'm just really excited to see this really honest portrayal and really like, um, you know, joyful portrayal of someone's mum, you know, if that makes sense. Again, with the whole mother-daughter relationships. I don't know, maybe I'm missing my mum. But yeah, I'm incredibly excited about it. Yeah, I, so Paula Stein, when I, when I saw it, I, again, Celeste Bell's, you know, done such a good job with this film because she has managed to strike an amazing balance between a celebration of her mother's life, but also tackling some really key issues that she had to deal with as well, because um, it delves deep into racial identity, which, as I've mentioned before, when we were talking about Minari as a son of a Malaysian immigrant, you know, that sort of being mixed race, which Celeste is and, and Polly was. It's, it's that sort of thing where it's like, it just resonates so deeply with you and you can understand. I, I and mean, you can't even fathom how it was to be in the 70s and to be put in the, the you know, the eye of the music industry and have to navigate that sort of stuff. Um, so she does a really good job of taking that balance of celebrating her mother's life and navigating the racial identity, sexism in the music industry, and also Polly's mental health, which becomes a factor in, in her life as well, because, you know, it's just that sort of thing with having the public eye on you and, and just it's, it's a lot for someone to take in. But the film just really does shine a light on on Polly, who was a, a real trailblazer and, and a punk pioneer, um, as much as I can saying that, but it's, it's true, like, you know, it's, I love their, I love their alliteration, so I can't help myself. But um, yeah, it's just a, a really a wonderful film that they've done well. And honestly, because Celeste was inherited all this material and all of her mother's diaries and artwork and everything, they have, you know, just so much material to use in this film that it gives you such a amazing look into her life that you probably wouldn't get from anyone else if it wasn't her daughter making it. So, yeah, I, I just can't, I can't say enough good words about it. I think it's an important documentary because I myself didn't have, I, I'd heard of her beforehand, but I wasn't like a big fan of anything. I didn't know too much about it. I just knew about x Specs and that was a band, and um, but I didn't know about her as a person really. So, this documentary will really open that, open the curtains and let you see exactly who she was. And I think she, I think in a way that is really, really, you know, respectful and lovely. And, and yeah, I think a lot of people will be won over by it. So that's 27th of February. That's a world premiere for that film. It is world premiering with us. And then it will be streaming at South by Southwest in March. So then it should hopefully be doing the rounds after that. So, um, 
I hope that um, it does get the chance to be seen by a lot of people. And I, again, would recommend it. Ayana as well. If it wasn't on your list already, I would totally recommend that one to you. Um, so, yeah, that is pretty much uh, the roundup of films that us three legends have uh, <laughs> decided we, you should all see or certainly make the time to try and see at the festival because the good thing about Classical Film Festival is there's so many good films that if you don't like the sound of the ones that you've mentioned, then there is another 50 on there that you can happily go and find, and I'm sure you'll find something you like. So, you know, Glasgow Film Festival is for everyone. There's going to be something in there for everyone, so please do just happily browse and, and choose what you want. But I hope from what we have said today that maybe it's it's highlighted or put a spotlight on something that you had maybe glossed over before. Um, and I think that the both of you have done such a wonderful job of like explaining why you uh, like like the films that you watched and why you want to see the films you watch. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time today to join me and have a chat. Um, what I will say is just before we leave, is there anything you guys would like to say just before we sign off? Um, anything out to anybody out there or anything just in general about stuff that you guys have maybe got going on that you want to point out you're doing? Um, floor is yours. Honestly, no. I don't have anything going on right now. I'm just watching movies. <laughs> yeah. well, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> I mean, you know, just in case, that, that I, would, I would be reticent not to, you know, give you the floor and be like, here, these people are really amazing and they're doing cool stuff too. So, you know, it's not all about Glasgow Film Festival. Although, you know, um, I'm sure someone will tell me off for saying that. But it's true, you know, when you have such amazing guests, it's nice to have them. Yep, yeah. I actually, I actually do have something to say. I just remembered. Um, um, I'm in the issue of this month's... Oh, I'm in this month's issue of The Skinny. Um, I directed the... Uh, I interviewed... Oh, my God, I can't say words anymore. I interviewed the director of uh, Black Bear, Lawrence Michael Levine, and Black Bear is also playing at Glasgow Film Festival. Um, so if you're curious about that, uh, pick up an issue of The Skinny this month. Hey, we love The Skinny. We love Black Bear. Um, that is ideal. That was perfect. And I didn't even have to uh, pay you to say it. So I mean, <laughs> brilliant. So everyone, thank you so much for, like I say, take the time to join us. Diana and Ailey, thank you so much. And for anyone that's watched, um, thank you. If you were, if you are worried that you're not going to see my face anytime soon, please don't fret, because if you can't wait anymore for my wonderful chat, In the Frame will return on Monday um, at the same time, uh, the 8th of February, so that's this coming Monday, um, and uh, we'll be having a chat about foreign cinema and uh, some of the key titles from the programme that are um, coming from around the globe. So, um, yeah, I really do hope that you mark it in your diary or your iPhone or whatever, however people use, whatever they use to keep track of what they've got going on in life now. My calendar is currently is, is you know, uh, blank because pandemic. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so please do um, mark it in your diary. Come back and join us on Monday where we'll talk a bit more about some other films from the festival. But, yeah, um, just thank you so much for taking the time. and. Um, God bless everyone. Stay safe. And we'll see you on Monday for another chat with some other special guests who will also be just as special as the two guests I've had today. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm sure you'll see a lot of Yana and Ailey on uh, doing um, wonderful things. So, um, guys, thank you so much. And uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. <laughs>